Hello and welcome to the Early Times. I want to thank uh, Paula Gordon and Ian Cobb for taking the time to have conversations with the candidates and to be able to share those conversations with you. Anecdotally, um, I've talked to some of the candidates and uh, they're having some degree of difficulty engaging folks uh, in this campaign. There seems to be some apathy and simple disinterest. I encourage you to please engage the candidates, find out who they are, what they stand for, because this is an extremely important election for Kimberley, for the region, and for the province. Not that all elections aren't important, but this one in particular, because we no longer have an incumbent that is, uh, that is running for re-election. So the MLA that we get is going to be extremely important uh, for us to be able to achieve our objectives over the next four years. So um, engage the candidates, find out what they stand for, please listen to these conversations, and most importantly, on May the 9th, get out and vote. Justin Hulis, you are running as an independent for the MLA position for Columbia River Revelstoke. And it always interests me to know why people do things. I'm supposed to ask what questions and not why questions, but the, when you're going to run as an independent, it seems that there, there might be a why question in there. Just uh, briefly let us know who you are and why you would do this. Okay, well, um... It started for me, I started to get involved in politics uh, a few years back and uh, when it came up to the federal election, I really wanted to see how it worked and I really wanted to get to know it. Uh, you see that all the things that it's doing and all the things that it could do, which is really what I'm in it for, is the things that it could do. And uh, as I got more involved, you started to see how the parties work and where they come up with platform and I decided to follow this all the way through and I followed it right to a national convention. And at the national conventions, you get to see uh, how they debate policy and they talk about policy and how they decide what becomes uh, the government's policy and essentially in the future the government's platform. And uh, what I seen out of this was that uh, at times when it's a big issue that affects everybody, they, they can do a good job. People get to go in, you get to debate it, you talk about it, majority votes, and whatever the vote is becomes the new rules. And... Um, like I said, it can work for a big policy, but when it comes to all the small community stuff, every single small community issue got voted right down. And it ultimately came to almost the same question every time. In, in, in Quebec, it was about a bridge they've been trying to get built for years. But somebody stands up and goes, my community spent 15 years trying to get this bridge, this bridge built for us. We finally got it done. Why is your issue a federal issue? Why does this matter to the entire country? And it doesn't. And uh, it's it's... They don't represent communities, that they represent the party, and it just it, it doesn't balance out very well. Well then, let's think about communities specifically. The city of Kimberley is where you live and where we are, and it is one of the anchor stores, if you will, in this writing. Uh, I'd like an understanding from you of what you think the key issues are and the opportunities here in Kimberley, and as a representative of of the uh, the other cities in the writing well going around and talking to people i think uh, affordable housing is probably one of the biggest issues in this entire election going on right now and uh, i think it spreads a lot further than our liberal government's really ready to uh, admit that it is uh it, it's a lot bigger than just the low-income people it's a lot of medium income people who can't possibly live on their own and they're never going to be able to buy a house even here uh, you know, they talk about how the rents or the cost of a house is getting up to be a, a million dollars up in Vancouver, but even in our own area, people can't afford that deposit. And their 5% uh, assistance to that is it's not going to change that. <laughs> uh, it, it's going to help some people for sure. It'll make it so people spend a little bit less when they do buy their first home, but it's not, it's certainly not a solution. <laughs> what more um, do you think government can do? Well, I kind of have been developing a, a plan on this. This is an issue that I really got going on. And when you start doing the research, a lot of the answers are kind of already out there. And I think the biggest change that our government could do to start making a difference in this would be if they were to switch to ownership instead of trying to make renters. If they were to go and set a limit to how much they're trying to make it cost, and uh, there's a lot of options to do this within $75,000 for a single person, a little bit more if you're looking at a big family house. But... Uh, there's a lot of cheap options out there. The answers are being produced. And if they were to go and set that limit, say $75,000, and then do a rent-to-own system with everybody and make it so that they're paying their own property taxes, they're paying for their own maintenance, 
for a lot of people, this would solve the issue. You could get rent down to as little as three, four, five hundred bucks, depending on what you want to work out with the people and how long they want to be on a mortgage. All of that money that's being invested in would come back into it, and you'd be able to reinvest it into future homes. And uh, yeah, okay, put down our costs a lot. Is there a constituency for that? Uh, what do you mean by that? Well, both in terms of who would um, avail themselves of that opportunity and those who would fund it. Well, hopefully, I mean, that's part of why I'm, why I'm running is the hope that I can get the provincial government to, to fund it. And I think that there would be a lot of people interested in going that route. And come 25 years from now, we'd have a free supply of money for it. Uh, obviously, right now, we're already investing money. The government's already putting uh, $920 million into building affordable units. They only intend to build 5,300 out of that, which works out to $173,000 per unit, which really isn't all that impressive when it comes to the low-income people. No, and it's just somebody making money, I think. That's exactly what it is, in yeah. my opinion. It's, it's the uh, very people who donate to them who are getting these projects, and they're just making money. Yeah. And affordable housing needs to be about affordable housing and not making money. <laughs> yeah, and it's not a provincial answer. It's more lower mainland-centric, I think. But. Yeah. Ian, you have experience up and down the, the riding. Would this play out throughout the riding? For sure, especially in this riding, um, with uh, more reliance on the tourism industry in this riding as opposed to Kootenai East. Yeah, uh, the Columbia Valley with, uh, with all the tourism jobs. Sure. The issues seem to be in this, uh, in this election cycle around a lot of things that are affected by money. Now that sounds kind of like a truism, but the money issues when it, with, with affordable housing is one of the issues. What other issues do you see that would be that kind of a mm, foundational money issue? Well, uh, obviously corporate donations has become a big talk and obviously uh, that needs to come to an end. I think we need to look at what the federal government's uh, done with their stuff and follow suit in a lot of ways. We need limits. We need to uh, make it so that you can only donate so much so that they have to talk to more people instead of just a few rich people. You need to go and uh, change it so that only British Columbians can donate. Right now, anybody in the entire world can donate to our provincial parties. That includes people over in other countries, um, other, obviously other provinces. Our parties do fundraise in other provinces. They regularly hold them in Calgary. Both parties do that. And uh, obviously that's not in the interest of British Columbians. And, it, does that have a specific application to opportunities in Kimberley itself? Uh, well, it has to do with basically the government being accountable to people and not to corporations. And it, it, it'll affect everything if that goes through because it'll make it so a lot more of the money is going to go to the individuals and the people who want to be heard. And it'll motivate them to listen more to a place like us who, you know, we still do have a population of people who could be their donors, but we don't have a lot of big corporations who can buy interest out of them. The Columbia Revelstoke, Columbia River Revelstoke <laughs> riding has common issues that affect all parts of the riding. What would you say, well let's spend four or five minutes thinking about this, what would some of those common interests be? Well obviously tourism is huge, uh, forestry is right across our whole area and uh, there's definitely quite a few connectors. A lot of our towns have a very similar feel, you know. A lot of people from out of town going door to door. I've been surprised how many people I find who are non-residents, you know, living here. It obviously means they can't vote for me, but <laughs> I've had a, an amazing number. Even, even in Kimberley that happens, in Invermere it's out of control depending what area you're in, especially there's, but uh, we've definitely got a lot that connects us. The you're shaking your head with a yes on that, Ian. When you say non-residents, you're not just talking about people who can't vote for you, but you're talking about, a, a, forgive my using the word, a transient kind of uh, element within the whole riding? Uh, yeah, not, I mean, well, the Columbia Valley is, uh, <laughs> is very unique. I mean, the Elk Valley is a bit like it, and Kimberley's got a little bit of it, but a third of the, peop of the houses in Invermere are or second homes and two thirds of the houses on in Windermere and on the the east side of Lake Windermere are uh, are uh, second homes. So um, is that true in Revelstoke as well? I wouldn't think so. No, um, the expansion of the ski hill may have added a few more, but uh, 
Revelstoke is is definitely more of the of the working town in the in the area. So the commonalities across the riding are are there, but there are also serious differences. Yeah, for sure. Uh, we're all in very different places. <laughs> How do you represent Revelstoke as a working town and Kimberley, just for instance, or Windermere in this case, as a tourist? based town how how do you represent all all of these <laughs> interests in one guy well for me this is part of why I, I think you need to be an independent because as a uh, as a person who's involved with the party they expect certain things out of you and they expect you to represent certain issues but as an independent you're you're free to represent everybody and i can dedicate all my time in uh, the legislative assembly to representing my community and so I can ask questions from people in Revelstoke, from people in Kimberley. I can raise their issues. I can try to actually represent everybody. And uh, obviously, it's a challenge. And obviously, there's uh, there's there's some differences in our riding. And uh, you know, you just you got to do the best you can. Um, did you flow into being a, an independent candidate because none of the established parties speak to you, or? Well, I, I took some time to look into that and to really look at it. And uh, looking at the, the Green Party, I looked at uh, YPP, your political party of BC. Uh, they actually offered to have me join them, but I didn't uh, didn't necessarily want to go that route. Say again, what is YPP? Uh, your political party. So Your political uh, party? Yes. <laughs> I thought that's what you said. Yes, that's their name. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are something like 34 or 62. There are a lot of parties There are a in lot MLA. of smaller parties. And... Uh, they're, they're an interesting one, but just as soon as you start to see the ties in their platform and the things that they're forcing commitment to, then you start to, you start to wonder, is this ever going to conflict with my constituents? And the is, answer, that, is that true of all of, the, all of the parties that you looked at? I, I think every party at some point is going to conflict. And I, I think, honestly, every uh, MLA who's probably ever been in power has at some point had that happen to them, where they were forced to follow party lines and you know, felt that they weren't representing their constituents, but it's uh, it's all about the team for them. And if you're in with the big team and you're working together, then the, then the idea is that, that you'll be able to, to get something done. So so they go along with it because, you know, this time I took a fall, but next time hopefully they'll do what I want. And uh, I don't think it always works out. And uh, I definitely don't think it's the way our government system was actually built because we originally never had parties when our system was built and it's never really been restructured to have them yeah they turned into a, a business as opposed to a party but <laughs> in a large way <laughs> every once in a while i like to think of the word party as party but i don't think that's how it's read anymore well then what is the role of our mla well the role of your mla is supposed to be that you uh choose a member of your community and this this used to be a bit smaller and in many areas it still is but, but, but the idea is that that person's supposed to go to Victoria and represent you and, you, and your uh, area's interest. And, of course, this uh, becomes an immediate conflict when you start getting the parties involved. I even had a constituent talk about that. And he says, as far as he's concerned, if you're running as a, uh, for, for a party, you're automatically in a conflict of interest. Hmm. Do and you I, see it that way? I think in a large way. At, at times, you definitely would be. Uh, not Not outright, I don't think. I mean... You do have some opportunity to try and share what your community wants, but at the end of the day, I mean, the party makes the choices and they tell you what to say. And our voting history says that our MLAs aren't standing up to them. You've been reporting on politics for a long time, Ian. Is that how you see it as well? <laughs> is, there, will... is there a question embedded in well, there's, that? There's, there's truth to it for sure, yeah. Um, there's, uh, like you were saying, there's always decisions that they have to make or, or side with that they know may not stick well with the, with the people back home, but um, I think generally they've been, you know, they stick to their, they've stuck to their guns, whether it's NDP or, or um, BC Liberal. Um, but yeah, there's been, there's been issues, yeah. When one elects to run for office, and that's different from being elected to office, <laughs> <laughs> you take on a kind of a larger persona how do you see your persona, if you will, as an MLA? How how would you be different and the same as an L, as the Columbia River Revelstoke MLA? <laughs> That's one of those questions. Uh, well, 
you know, I, I want to open it up. Basically, I want to make it so that the relationship between your MLA and your uh, and your constituents is, is very different. And I have a few strategies to accomplish this. And uh, Doug Klovchuk's actually uh, on, on board with one of them as well. And he hopes to accomplish it as well, which is which is good news. And, and that's uh, he wants to create a committee within each uh, each of our major cities that will go and uh, go out and talk to people and then come back and bring back ideas from all the different areas. And to have them be an advisory council to the MLA, and uh, I agree with that. Along with some modernizations, I would like to see an online forum that would allow people to discuss it uh, politely, or else uh, it's not going to be tolerated. <laughs> um, but 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 I think that you could uh, allow a lot of people to have a lot more input through that, and you could go and make it so that they can come in, they can talk about their issues, they can talk about um, how their business is struggling, they can talk about infrastructure projects that they want done and all of this could be put onto there and it would allow your constituency office to be able to look through what's going on and say okay well you're having this business problem the government actually already offers this program because there's a lot of programs a lot of programs to help businesses that people don't know about well it's interesting it sounds like you're moving toward a social media kind of addition to the mix i would like to up the social media but i do want to keep the the personal side of it as well but I definitely think that there's a lot of uh, a lot of ability for people to communicate that way. I've been amazed throughout my campaign how many people have chosen to use uh, Facebook or uh, similar social media sources as the way to reach out to me and talk about things. That, that definitely took me off guard. I didn't see it would be that way. But uh, that and emails, I mean, I've only gotten uh, probably 20, 30 phone calls and tons and tons and tons of emails and Facebook. So. Well, Ian, uh, you're now seven years into Eno, which is all internet based. Is are you seeing this same kind of movement to electronic communication? Very much so. Yeah. And does that play into what the MLA is or would be? Absolutely. I think MLAs could really utilize, uh, let's say, Facebook, for example. Um, very I don't well. happen to like Facebook. I do it, but I don't like it. Can we be? Can we? Can we uh, expand that to be social media platforms? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Um, LinkedIn, Twitter, all the, the different kinds. Um, yeah, I, I think it's, uh, it's a cost-effective medium for people to, to reach out, for government to reach out and, and uh, speak to the people without having to spend a fortune on media, on advertising and things like that to, uh, to get that message across. Now they can just throw it out on the on Facebook and big, you know, fish hook and see what they can catch. Well, it's interesting thinking about you as an MLA from this writing. It is hard to be all over this writing. It's a big geographical footprint. Isn't that part of what the MLA challenge is in a writing like this? It is definitely a huge part of our challenge. Our writing is just massive and uh, and w with decent sized communities spread out, most of the other writings of any uh, similar size, at least have a base area. They have some major city or a major area, but we're almost one side to the other, uh, basically a five hour drive to go from here to Revelstoke. And yes. Yeah, it's uh, definitely a challenge. Well, as an independent, it's uh, the, the question that comes to my mind is a little different. So be patient with me with this. Say that you, that you win as the MLA. And I would ordinarily say, but your party doesn't win. <laughs> How does that affect the representation? The, and as I say, because you're running as an independent, it's somewhat different, but still, how do, you, how do you have your voice heard if you're not the dominant force? Does that put it a little better? Yeah, yeah, no, obviously, unless we, uh, unless we end up with a minority government and you end up in a coalition, then uh, there's no way that you know, I end up in government. And uh, obviously that, that changes how things work a little bit, but uh, a lot of people talk about the in-government thing. I've heard, I've heard the advertisements where they're talking about how you'll be better off with an in-government MLA, and I really personally do not believe this. Uh, back in 2001 to 2005, Kimberly especially saw a lot of things happen in our government. We had an in-government MLA at that time, and she was sent as a representative to come talk to us and tell us why the government was doing what they were doing when she should have been on the other side fighting for us. For me, it would be that simple. No matter what's going on, if it's hurting our riding, 
I know where I stand. I should be uh, sitting there fighting the government, arguing about it, making sure that everybody here is being heard, their concerns are being heard and discussed. And as far as uh, them actually having any more power, I mean, they still only have the one vote that they have. And past that, uh, the only way to really have any more of that is through working with your with your party, which, I mean, I like to hope that I'd be able to work with some of the people as well. I mean, I, I don't want to go in there and just, uh, you know, be aggressive and angry and start uh, trying to tell them they're all doing it wrong. I'm hoping to be able to cooperate, but obviously that's a two-sided <laughs> deal. <laughs> Um, the other, the big parties obviously have lots of resources to spend on an election. Um, and I guess you're, you're carrying the bill by yourself. So, um, you feel there's a bit of an unfair advantage to, uh, let's say the NDP and the liberals for the, for the signage and the advertising and, and all that, as opposed to the, the smaller parties or the independents who can't afford that kind of media time. Certainly, our, our rules are even written a little bit that way. Um, for example, until I received my uh, official um, certificate of candidacy, which only happened when the election started, I wasn't actually able to uh, hand out tax receipts for donations. Anybody who would donate to me as an independent would have to have just given me money, just straight out. And the parties wrote those rules. They get to collect money for four years, and independents get to collect it for four weeks. Yeah. <laughs> And I, we are definitely at a, at a disadvantage, but uh, if you get into government, you have all the same equal rights that anybody else would have from that point on. But obviously, it's a lot more of a struggle to get there. Uh, I'm, I'm trying not to use the word bomb thrower, but I can't quite find a way around it. How do you keep from just being somebody who is a bomb thrower in the, in the midst of uh, of this entire electoral process and, and representative government. How do you keep from just being a big noisy thing off at the side? How do you become part of the working uh, interior of a government if you are an independent? I just don't know this. How do how would you <laughs> do this? So you're talking like if I got elected yes. but wasn't uh, obviously in government? Okay. Well, um... well, even if you were in government, but the odds are, if yes. you got elected, you would not be in It's government. possible, but not likely right. at all. <laughs> but um, basically, it, it, it just comes down to trying to represent your community and making it so that you're, you're trying to work with people, and again, not trying to uh, necessarily just obstruct everything that they're doing, which I feel there's a lot of going on in our legislative assembly. Uh, the parties just want to make the other guy look bad, and they don't necessarily care about what's right or wrong. For a large part, uh, there are definitely policies within each party that I think are definitely worth supporting. And uh, there are policies in each party that I think are definitely not doing us any favors. And uh, for me, it would be going through and deciding what's good, what's bad, where do I stand, and trying my best to be a honest voice that's trying to represent my constituents and with no other motive. Okay. What are some of the, uh, uh, the things that the government are doing that you could get behind or don't agree with in this riding in particular? In our riding in particular? Uh, well, obviously there's a lot of questions going on with uh, Jumbo Wild, and I think it's about time to admit that that's been uh, spoken for, and I think that it's time to shut that down. Uh, even if they were to open it up now, even if it worked, there would be, there would be protesters sitting outside. It, it, it's not going to be a real project, and I think it's time that our government admits that one. For us, um, we've been fighting for a long time to get a conservation officer. The NDP say, or for Revelstoke, and the NDP say that they'll do that. They're going to increase the number of conservation officers. I haven't specifically said to that writing, but uh, I have my my hopes high that th that they would do that under that commitment. Uh, the BC Liberals, a um, little less sure about it. I see no mention of it in their platform, but uh, I've heard Doug suggest that uh, if he gets elected, that might happen, but. <laughs> If he doesn't, uh, I'm not too sure. <laughs> what what kind of a wrap up would you like? What's your elevator speech and why people should be supportive of you, Justin Holtz? Well, largely, I just want to go out and get representation for my community. It's why I'm running. It's it's what happened for me. I was looking at it, and I don't see a party that represents me, and I don't, I don't see that uh, being able to change by working with any of the parties and. So I want to represent our community, and I'm hoping that people want to be represented. <laughs> thank you very way. much for joining us in the conversation. Yes, thank you.